the Phoenix Suns are never losing again. DeAndre Ayton speaks out about his contract situation and more coming up on Locked on Suns. You are Locked on Suns, your daily Phoenix Suns podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. We are back. This is Locked On Phoenix Suns. We are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, and I'm your host, Brendan Clean, covering the Suns as a credentialed media member the past five seasons, and your host here every single day. Thank you for making Locked On Suns your first listen every single morning. Follow the show on Twitter at Locked On PHX Suns, and follow me on Twitter at Brendan Clean14. Thank you again for joining us here. The Suns are winners today, 119 to 74, just straight bullying the Portland Trailblazers. I'm going to break down that game and the Suns' preseason overall. It actually segues perfectly into question number 12 of our Suns' 13 questions that will define the Suns' season preview series. And uh, in between that, I want to talk about DeAndre Ayton and he uh, his comments at practice this week when he finally spoke out about his situation with regard to his contract extension. So we'll get into that in the next segment. But let's start with this game. Again, a 119-74 victory. And look, I don't have a ton to necessarily add to what the Suns have done. I think that this is another example of everything that I've been saying about every single game. What I will start with is that as much as I was the guy clamoring to not put too much into the preseason last year when the Suns went 0-4, let's have a freaking celebration. Let's have a party. This is uh, this is cool to see. Just blowout after blowout win after blowout win for the Suns in this year's preseason. 3-1 is their final record over this four-game stretch. They now have basically a full week before they need to get ready to play on October 20th, which is a nice break for them and a surreal amount of time on the short end for my mental capacity. I'm floored by the fact that they are going to play a game that quickly. But look, celebrate this. This is awesome, and it's another example of the culture and the cohesion and the identity that this team is going to have. I am going to close out the show with thoughts on what this preseason tells us overall. So I'm not saying that there is nothing to take away or nothing that will be different or nothing uh, as far as a lesson to learn. But where I really wanted to start here today is Devin Booker. Um, He played in this game, started in this game, Chris Paul did not play, although he was technically active. He sat out this contest. Cameron Payne got the start. And Book, look, I think it was a smart thing to do to go ahead and rest him for the first three of these games, not only because I do think that conditioning and uh, cardio are the things that seem to be the the last to get back for players, but also after COVID-19, but also just why push it after running through the playoffs and then to Tokyo for the Olympics and only getting about a month and a half break, there's no reason to push it. So I thought that was smart. He only played 18 minutes tonight and he, uh, he made us, he, he made a, the, the, the weight worth uh, it for us in terms of the show that he put on 17 points, six of 10 from the field, three of six from three and looked like the same old guy. Frankly, I, I loved the pull-up threes, I liked the fact that six of his 10 shots were from deep. Now, maybe that was his version of taking it a little bit easier tonight as he's getting back to full health and condition. However, I don't uh, I don't hate it, and I would love to see more of that. And I was we were talking about this yesterday, actually, with Mo Dekeel. I totally recommend checking out the show, um, talking all things Suns defense. It was really sort of, you know, what is next for DeAndre Ayton and the Suns defense. And we got to Booker at the end. And one of the things we were talking about with him was pacing and um, controlling moments of the game, controlling his own output and not being tired, not 
you know, having miscues mentally and physically because of fatigue. And I, as much as we put pressure on Booker to take those threes, and certainly those are difficult shots, I do think there's an element of being able to add that to your game that can be less tiring because as difficult as it is in the footwork and the timing and the muscle repetition and all the stuff that goes into becoming a marksman from deep on pull-up shots, it's not, it's not nearly as tiring as, as driving the basket. So again, I'm not going to say that 60% of Devin Booker's shots this season are going to be threes just because that's what we saw in this preseason game. 18 minutes in a beatdown in a preseason game is by no means indicative of what we're going to see all year long, but very much cleared any expectations we would have had, looked perfectly ready to play, and now has this week to go full out in practice to scrimmage, I'm sure, and be ready come opening night. I don't have any qualms about Devin Booker, no worries about Devin Booker at all. The other things I really am going to get into in the final segment in terms of, you know, what can we take away from this preseason as a whole? And I'll just give a little bit of a sneak peek, I suppose, on that stuff right now, um, because it, it, it very much was exemplified in this game. But you had the assists and the threes just exactly where you want them to be. 39% from deep and 30 assists. Um, 16 turnovers is a little high, but again, it's the preseason. Like somebody like Jalen Smith with three turnovers, Chandler Hutchison with two turnovers. Those guys are not going to be playing much in the regular season. So you take those out, you're at 11, you're feeling a lot better. I think that number, those thresholds, 30 assists and you know at least more threes than they put up last season are going to be check marks that I'm really looking for. They pass them tonight and they're getting it from everybody. It's not as if Devin Booker has just been taking 10 threes a game or Chris Paul's dishing 12 assists, campaign getting eight assists. Uh, It's none of that. Although Peyton did almost get a triple double tonight and had nine of his own. It's everybody. It's an identity. It's the 0.5 system and it's all working. And it all looks like every single guy on this roster gets the deal as Monty Williams would say when it comes to this offense. So that's tremendous. We'll talk about it more to close out the show as we answer question number 12. What can the Suns preseason tell us about what they will do in the regular season? And uh, look at that. Look at me planning ahead, getting the idea um, and executing it to perfection on this 12th question number 12 here. Uh, Let's get to DeAndre Ayton though, because he is the story of the day, continues to be the story of the day. First though, a quick word from Sweatblock. Sweatblock is the little secret to confidence right in your back pocket. It is not your typical deodorant, but it gets the job done even better than your typical deodorant. Throw out your ideas of the stick of deodorant that you've got to, it's big, it can melt, you've got to you know, rub it. It feels chalky. I know plenty of people who don't even like that at all. Throw that idea out the window. Sweat block is new, is improved, and makes you feel much, much better than your typical deodorant. That's because it's not like one at all. It is more like a wet nap. You swipe it open, pull the pad out, pull the tab out, whatever you want to call it, wipe out, apply it under your arms. They say, do it before bed, go to sleep, and you're good for a week. It's doctor created, doctor recommended. They come with a dry shirt guarantee. So if Sweatblock doesn't keep you dry, you get your money back. It's been tested by firefighters as well as over 13,000 reviewers on Amazon and you can trust it. They say keep it for a week. I get it. You live in Arizona. Maybe you got a particular issue with odor and sweat. Maybe you let it last a few days. Look, that's much better than the deodorants that you're used to where you're applying multiple times per day just to make it through. Again, that's why they call Sweatblock your little secret to confidence. You can wear what you want to wear. You can fit it in any bag, your pocket, whatever it might be. Get it out there. Get you through the day risk-free with with the odor, with the scent, with the wetness. Or um, look, it's not even just risk-free. It is worry-free. You're, you're completely good to go. So if you or maybe someone you love could use this product, go to sweatblock.com. Use the promo code Locked On at checkout to get 20% off your order. Again, that's sweatblock.com. Promo code Locked On at checkout for 20% off or check them out at Amazon and CVS. DeAndre Ayton, disappointed to not have new extension done yet with Phoenix Suns. That is a headline from Kellen Olsen over at Arizona Sports. First of all, just a tremendous shout out to Kellen, former host of this show, frequent guest of this show, uh, my friend, 
and uh, has just been killing this entire story, been killing coverage of this team dating back all through last season. He, he, as, as in addition to, I am all um, back covering in person. And this is the type of story that gets you where you need to go with the news. Um, Kellen was able to do this from being at practice. I was not there. And I love that this is something that's able to happen again, because the Suns did not, they send out, typically they send out recordings of all of their practice video sessions. They did not send this one out. This one was not made available to everybody. It was specifically because Kellen and Gerald Bourget and Dwayne Rankin have been asking and asking and asking to get time with DeAndre Ayton. It took almost two weeks, but it eventually happened today. And uh, DeAndre Ayton expressed his frustration, unsurprisingly. His quote, I love Phoenix, but I'm really disappointed that we haven't really gotten a deal done yet. We were two wins from a championship, and I just really want to be respected, to be honest. Be respected like my peers are being respected by their teams. Now, of course, he was very clear that he doesn't want this to get in the way. He said he's going to let his agents, Bill Duffy and Neiman Machian, and the Suns front office handle it. He said, quote, in the most professional way possible and just control what I can control when he was asked if there was going to be a deal done. He also very much said that the goal is still to win a championship, that he doesn't want to let this affect the task at hand. And that's kind of the part that I want to talk about. Um, First of all, I do just want to say the fact that he's expressing his disappointment, that he has, he finally gave, uh, gave in or agreed to do a media availability to talk about this and struck such a sour chord. It makes me it makes me pretty um, pessimistic that there's going to get uh, that they're going to get a deal done here. I really felt confident that something would happen. I felt even when Woj put out that story originally, I I had the inclination personally that they would still be able to do something that they could do non-guarantees that they could do incentives and basically have it where the guaranteed number was under the max, but that you could get to the max by, you know, maybe winning a championship, maybe rebounding or points averages. There's a lot of ways. Clint Capella had a contract like this. Um, There's a lot of players that do. I think the famous one was Otto Porter a few years ago with the three point percentage. It's common in the NBA, even it just doesn't, even if it doesn't always get talked about. That's what I thought. This makes me feel a lot less confident as does the tweet courtesy of Kellen Olson as well. Let me get to it here. It was, look, Robert Sarver declining to answer questions. Kellen's tweet. Suns owner Robert Sarver on Burns and Gambo passed on questions about negotiations with DeAndre Ayton before saying he believes James Jones is still having conversations with Ayton's agent, and Sarver confirmed they both want to get something done that works for both sides. This after... John Gambadoro, Gambo reported that discussions are still ongoing. So I don't want to I don't want to make it sound like this is dead in the water that there's, you know, no chance, but the reality is we are T minus by the time most of you will hear this, uh, less than 5 days away from the deadline. The deadline for those of you who do not remember is Sunday or I'm sorry, um Monday, is that right? Whatever the tw- the 18th is and It is, yeah, it's Monday, and that's the reality. The reality is DeAndre Ayton is out here saying he's disappointed. He wants to be respected. To me, that says I feel like I have earned a high, high high-dollar contract and other players on winning teams that are not as productive and not as accomplished as I am have gotten a max contract that I'm asking for. And Robert Sarver is basically saying, uh, you know, in my opinion, reading between the lines, his comments on in terms of basically refusing to say anything that that to me says we've we've made our side known, we've made our perspective known, and that's what that's what that's where we are, right? So that's it's 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 hard to feel optimistic. It's hard to feel necessarily like that's going to result in a contract unless things, you know, really do change between now and then. 
couple of things to get to on the other part of this. The one thing I said a minute ago of the players and the task at hand and the locker room and will it affect that? I've actually come around in a more optimistic way on that part of it since I originally started to talk about it on the show when free agency hit. And that's because of comments like those from Chris Paul and others who have said, you know, we're going to get this guy paid. I'm not worried about it. It's a business. These guys are going to be paid what they're earned. It's just a matter of negotiations and all of the typical stuff that plays out in the NBA. Basically nothing to worry about. Nothing to see here has sort of been the message. And so of course, there's some dip- there's some diplomacy that goes on there. I'm not necessarily saying that that's the full truth, that none of these guys are worried about it. And of course, you hear DeAndre Ayton say he's disappointed. That's not quite the same as saying you're not worried about it at all, right? But I don't think that this is going to be a problem of DeAndre Ayton you know, glaring across the locker room and, oh, you've been paid and I have not been paid. Even if Mikhail Bridges does get a extension done between now and the deadline, which we've still heard very, very little about. My inclination is still that there is basically a deal done in uh, basically everything but writing at this point, and they just don't want to announce it prior to DeAndre Ayton's contract situation being finished. That's just a hunch. I don't know, but I don't think the situations are the same. I don't think DeAndre Ayton is going to be glaring across that locker room and saying, you know, Mikhail got his and and Chris got his. I don't think the com- the the um the situations are comparable. I don't feel like DeAndre Ayton will be looking at what CP is getting and feeling as if that should be owed to him. I don't think he'll be looking at Mikhail Bridges, who is bound to get significantly less money than than Ayton, and feeling as if Mikhail is somehow you know, to blame for his own negotiations falling through. I don't think that's what's going to happen. I think it can galvanize these guys. And I'm not really worried about that part as much as I may have been. The last part of this is just if we're assuming that we're getting closer to a world in which there is not a contract that gets done, not an extension that gets done, and we see DeAndre Ayton next offseason enter restricted free agency and, and be put into a place where he's now looking for a offer sheet, a maximum offer sheet from another team, which would be significantly smaller. It's mostly because it could only be four years rather than five, which is what the Suns are able to give him now by by being the incumbent team, being the team that he's on right now. What you get to with that route is who's going to be the one to pay him. And so I will I will say that if you're talking about leverage and you're you're giving credibility credence to what James Jones and Robert Sarver are saying you're going to look around the league right and you're going to say okay well who could re- reasonably do it and we saw I mean the big thing coming out of free agency was teams completely punting on 2022 cap space. If you look right now it's basically just the Pistons who have cap space right now scheduled for next off season. Now, of course, there's non-guarantees, there's options. Teams can create cap space. You can go through and find teams. The Pelicans, for example, are a team I could imagine DeAndre Ayton potentially being a fit for. They have a non-guarantee for Josh Hart. They have a um, basically a, a cap hold for Jonas, Jonas Valanciunas and a couple other guys. They could create space. They could trade some of their young players away and create enough to give Aiton a pretty big offer sheet. But I will say, if you're looking and saying Detroit is the only team, so unless you're going to go get that offer sheet from Detroit, first of all, not sure they're even going to pay it. Second of all, good luck going to play for the Pistons, DeAndre, right? I mean, this is just the case that that management could make if we're just being honest and, and giving credence to both sides here. That's what's going to be happening. There's not a lot of cap space. There are even fewer teams who are going to be looking to sign a big money, big man with their cap space, even if they can create it. And then you're down to, you know, can there be a sign in trade? And then the Suns would have to basically green light anything that happens. So I get that part. And at the same time, that is where things would get ugly. You want to talk about feeling disappointed and, and potentially disrespected like Aiton has said he he feels. Well, imagine if you have to go do the shameful thing of getting a freaking Pistons offer sheet. I mean, that's, it, I really hope it doesn't get to that point. 
I think the best case scenario here would, would be for them to come to an extension that makes sense for both sides. The next best case is if they don't, Aiton just goes out and kicks ass all year and they con- they sign him to a new contract right away next summer. It doesn't have to mean that he has to go get an offer sheet. They can wait till next summer and still give him a deal immediately. He doesn't have to go do that necessarily. That would be you know, the next best option. But I think we should all be hoping just from a chemistry standpoint and this team being the best that it can be standpoint, that that's not where it ends up getting, where he's going to Detroit or New Orleans and, and getting this, this offer and having to kind of come crawling back to the Suns or ask for a sign and trade or any of this, that's get, that gets really ugly and it, it damages the team. They're, they're probably unlikely to get a situation if that were to play out that way, that's going to make them nearly as good as they are right now. All right. That's closes us out. That's the latest on Aiton. We'll have a little bit more. Hopefully I'm going to ask Jake Fisher, a bleacher report about the Deandre Aiton situation when we talk with him tomorrow. So there'll be more to come there. And, uh, by Monday, we'll know. We will know. Um, it, going into the first game of the season, we will have had two days of clarity on this. So um, that's that's where things stand. We'll get to final takeaways that could tell us what the Suns will look like in the regular season coming out of the preseason in just one second. First, though, a quick word from betonline.ag. BetOnline is the fastest and the easiest way to bet on all of your favorite sports. And they are back and better than ever with all teams back on the gridiron for another football season. BetOnline is your number one spot for all the pro and college football all season long. And with the new and updated site, they have even more odds, props, and contests for every single football fan. Head to betonline.ag on the web or on their mobile app. Make an account today, and when you do, use the promo code LOCKEDON when you make your first deposit to get a 50% welcome bonus. Again, that's promo code locked on when you make your first deposit at betonline.ag to get a 50% welcome bonus straight to your account from football and basketball and boxing to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for the entire 2021 season. Bet online again, the fastest and easiest way to bet on all of your favorite sports. Bet online where the game starts. All right. Question number 12 in our Suns preview series, 13 questions that will define the Phoenix Suns season. What can the preseason tell us about the regular season? It's pretty simple. What will be different based on what we saw in the regular in the preseason? Um, and it, I'm going to go right back to the things I was talking about a moment ago when I was recapping the game. It's if you remember back when Ricky Rubio was first signed or, you know, getting a lot from Monty during his first training camp about how Rubio and Booker would fit together and some of the benchmarks that he was watching to see if that group, if that duo was, was being successful. And he pointed a lot of the time to 30 assists. That was, that was a big marker for him. And through the preseason, I think they've hit that number twice, two or three times. And they've been, just below it every other time. During the regular season last year, they averaged 26.9 assists per game. Um, I would be looking for them to clear 27. I think that that number will go up. They were third in the league, so it's not unprecedented. It's not, you know, unexpected that they could get higher. I believe actually the season before when Rubio was around, they were even more assists per game than that. Yeah. 27.2. So I wouldn't be surprised if they get back closer to that 27.2 number. I think Booker will get more assists this year. I think uh, Payne will get more assists this year. And I think Shamit more so than Carter or Moore or Galloway is going to be able to put the ball in his teammates' hands and get some assists that way as well. I just think this team in year two together will just have more communication and clarity about what it is that they're going out there and trying to do every night. And I think that will help. So that's the big thing. They they were way higher than uh, normal during the preseason. I think that will continue. The other big one is three-point attempts per game. Last year, they were middle of the pack. I mean, that's just per game. That's not frequency as a percentage of your total attempts or any of that stuff, which I think they were higher in. But just straight up three-point attempts per game, 34.6, and that was 15th, dead middle. Much higher than the prior season, so trending upward. And I think that trend will continue. Again, this In this game against Portland, they were at 41. And assists and threes are always going to go hand in hand. I mean, the most assisted shots, obviously, with the way the game is played today, are going to be 
probably corner threes or, you know, just threes in general for your shooters and then at rim attempts, right? I mean, if you can drive and, and throw a lob to DeAndre Ayton, throw the ball to a cutter, those are going to be assisted oftentimes as well. But you're not going to get, you know, mid-range shots and things like that. Those aren't assisted because it's not 1995 anymore in the NBA. So if you're getting more assists, that's going to mean more rim attempts and more three attempts, which are great. That's the reason you try to move the ball is to get great shots instead of good or mediocre or bad shots. So I think what that means to me too, as you trickle down, is the offense could be even better. I think sixth in the NBA last year was no fluke. I think they have the talent to be one of the top three, top five at least offenses in the league over the course of the season. And Booker getting better. A lot of those things we've been talking about all year. Mikhail Bridges taking a step forward. The presence of Shamit, the growth of pain, all those things. Better health, hopefully. Um, although it can't really get much better at the very top than that. But, you know, Sharich, Cam Johnson, Jay Crowder, a lot of those guys actually did miss some time last year. I think people are just underrating that health was actually a factor for this team last season, even if Booker and Paul, for the most part, and Aiton stayed healthy. So all of that to me, more assists, more threes, better cohesiveness, better communication, more uh, of just maximizing what their identity already has been. That's what the preseason showed me. The preseason also showed me, just to close things out here, that the Suns are just going to be able to blow the top off of games a lot more than they did last season. That wasn't, you know, always in in their, it wasn't always possible for them, just based on how things, um, you know, turnovers, growing pains. By the end of the year, they were really dominating and beating bad teams and everything else. And we obviously saw that against the Nuggets, the depleted Nuggets in the playoffs and the the Lakers when they weren't healthy in the first round. And I think that's just going to be more of the same. I mean, the Suns are showing that their depth and, and all of this stuff is just going to be able to make them be dominant on the right nights. And so I think we will see that as well all year. And I still don't understand how anybody is wanting to bet the under unless you're just really looking into your crystal ball and feeling like you can predict injuries here. This team is going to be great this regular season, and I'm excited to watch it. I'm sure you guys are too. Three and one preseason. I got to head over to the Footprint Center myself now uh, to catch the Mercury game, game two of the WNBA Finals. Maybe we'll talk about it as the weeks go along here. Series is not very long in the W, so we are going to be wrapped up soon. But uh, that'll be it for me then, guys. Jake Fisher, a Bleacher Report tomorrow to give you the latest on Jalen Smith, the Suns roster, Thaddeus Young. Maybe he'll have some extension thoughts, pick his brain on all of the great reporting he's done all year. Again, thank you for making Locked on Suns your first listen every single day, and I'll be back tomorrow.